Welcome to Happy Times and Places, a positively inclined Doctor Who episode commentary podcast in which I, Toby Haydock, watch a story chosen by a friend of mine, commentate along, drop some fact bombs and observations, and try to guess what my guest's favourite things about each episode might be. Hi, Toby. Da- Daisy Connolly here, retired comedian. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about the five things that I love about my Who story, which is Terror of the Zygons. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode two of Terror of the Zygons and episode, well, whatever this is, of Happy Times and Places. I'm not counting. Anyway, what a delight to reconnect, even though without doing so, I mean, actually, with Daisy Connolly, a uh, reformed comedian, as she said, also writer. She, I, I'm sure Daisy has written erotic fiction. I've got a feeling when we were doing sort of comedy workshops and stuff, word got out that Daisy wrote for Mills and Boone, but I could be wrong. Uh, I'm sure she will tell me when she listens to this. But I remember being quite envious just of the idea of having, you know, of having you know books in print and published. I thought that was a great endeavour, but not one I'd be able to turn my own skills to. But I like the idea of doing it. Um, but yeah, multi-talented, artistic type is Daisy. And they're called Toffee Fee, the gift she got me at my birthday when... Uh, when colleagues came out, when I was at a pretty, yeah, pretty funny old place, and I always, I'm always a bit, I'm, I'm always, I'm always a glass half empty person. Uh, my sense of humour is such that I will, you know, look on the, look on the, the pessimistic side of things, and I always, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 I will always you know, think I'm in a worse place probably than I am. But I think it's because I don't want to be too optimistic because I don't like being disappointed. But also, you know, I was, I was brought up not to blow your own trumpet, uh, which is, you know, not to get ideas above your station. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I, 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 I never want to appear um, <laughs> confident, happy, because I suspect I'm not. But, um, but you know, I'm always cautious of that, which is why my... My perspective is always a bit, oh, it's a bit rubbish. But loads of people, you know, loads of lovely friends came out on that on that birthday, which is the second of January, which is a very bad time to have a birthday. Maybe that's why I'm pessimistic and glum, is because I was born on the day that the nation sleeps. But all I had to do was put the signal out, and colleagues came out, and some, like Daisy, brandishing toffee fee, and uh, you know, sometimes you get a present that you weren't expecting. And that you didn't know you want, and it actually turns out to be the best present. One Christmas, it was a book about Simon D that I didn't know existed, and it was just a stocking filler because the bookshop was closing down. And uh, and uh, uh, and it, yeah, and I, I remember saying, "Oh, where, where'd you get that?" Oh, it was just had a reduced sticker on it, so I got it. Thought you might be interested, and I read it from start to finish very quickly. Uh, and it wasn't one of my main presents at all, and uh, I can't remember what else I got in January two thousand and six. But I remember those toffee fee. Thanks. Daisy. So, and Daisy has also now given me an unexpected gift in Terror of the Zygons, learning to watch it uh, from start to finish uh, and appreciate it unfolding. And I'm trying, you know, not to have foreknowledge. I do have a little bit of foreknowledge, but but watching it in the way that Happy Times and place makes, Places makes you watch it, which is watch it unfold, you know, hopefully watch it without any preconceptions and definitely watch it um, with the attitude that one is to be positive. That was really easy to do with episode one. I'm not sure Days is choosing things specific to each episode. Remember, she was recording her stuff, I think, before one of these had even gone out. So everyone was flying blind a little bit. So she, she says in her intro she's choosing five things. Uh, she's already chosen the spaceship, which has clobbered me because that definitely would have been one of my choices, the, you know, the the globby pizza interior of the Zygon ship. Uh, that's gone. So kudos to designer Nigel Curzon. I will not be able to bestow an honour upon you, Mr Curzon, but uh, but Daisy already has. But that's definitely one of the best things about the story. But let's see if I can find another four more, including one specific to this episode, episode two, which I am going to start watching in three Two, one.
uh, for those who are keeping track of uh, the uh, media on which Toby Haydock's Happy Times and Places are cons- uh, consuming their their particular episodes. I watched episode one on Blu-ray, but thanks to some jiggery pokery by my other half with the robot lady at the end of it. I don't think she's a robot lady, she's an actual lady. Um, now, we're now back on BritBox because there'd been some sort of calamity, which means that it had been assigned to me. And not Anyway, let's not get into that. We have the recap. Uh, and I think, I mean, it's just a reminder of how gorgeous that cliffhanger. And I can't, but, but it's it's got the added thing of because it doesn't go into the closing titles. The scream sort of echoes and then gets cut off and goes to silent. I don't know what it is you call that doing that with the sound, but it's a, it's a distinctive way of having the sound where it sort of echoes and goes. And uh, the sound man is Mike McCarthy, uh, Michael McCarthy, who's done loads. He, he was actually hired to do the sound on the, you know, the remount of uh, Sharda, you know, the bits with uh, older Tom Baker, um, because producer Charles Norton, I think, wanted it to be... Um, you know, authentic. So Michael has a, a long connection with Doctor Who, but I interviewed him and Pat Hyam, Graham's operator. And I I assumed they'd been in touch for years and years and years, but it was only during the course of the interview that they'd got together again after years to be interviewed by me and used it as an excuse to hook up again. So that was lovely to be part of. Anyway, we have Lilius Walker here um, as the very scary Sister Lamont. They've made his face a little bit shiny, haven't they? Um and yeah she's uh she's very spooky because this is of course a a doppelganger story which is a which is a lovely uh motif um it's a it's a it's a it's a lovely recurring you know science fiction uh storytelling implement if you like the uh the use of scary doubles and replacements and you know uh, aliens you know aliens amongst us and all of that um i mean it's not a very it's quite a sparsely inhabited story so uh, you know, there's only three zygons uh, and they you know disguise themselves as sister Lam- it's, it's lament isn't it it's lament it's not lamont so i must say duncan lament who was of course in the quater mass experiment and death to the daleks um Oh, it's oh yes, yeah, a bit in the decompression chamber. This is always, I think this is always a bit weird. Oh, and doesn't she spot it through the door? Yes, she's about to spot it through the door. I think now, um, and you get a you get a glimpse of it, don't you? In that look, I love that the Zygon. I think the Zygon designs are so brilliant. But that is a beautiful glimpse, and I've got this picture. I've got a really good quality copy of the picture of the Zygon uh, at the decompression wheel shut making it shut the zygon costumes are absolutely magnificent um i I mean if you look carefully you can see the see the join at the waist but i i I mean i i think you'd have to be very ungenerous not to say that uh color texture i love the fact they're slightly orange and the orange and green light here in the spaceship really helps i never think doors quite work in organic spaceships because they have to be able to sort of work in a studio so they're always a bit flatter and more uh, and and more sort of geometric than, than and and everything else, but um, you you can see their veins. I think it's so amazing, and the lighting in here is absolutely terrific. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'd forgotten about this. This is that they capture Harry and basically say, um, and now we are going to behave as if we have been written by. Chris Chibnall and we go to stop the story and explain everything. I mean, they're not explaining how they feel, at least. But um, <laughs> um, but it really, it, it really is sort of exposition central. So, having had a perfect episode one, sc- scripturally, this is this really is. Hello, you're our prisoner. Info dump. Uh, which, which, but it's kind of getting away with it because the visuals are so extraordinary. Uh, the music is lovely. The lighting, please, again, um, there's the Scarrison, which I'm slightly worried about. That was okay. Um, the ultimate weapon. That's right. But look, you can see the veins in his face. And it's a very different performance from the Duke of Fog. I've got a feeling, isn't he? He's credited as Duke of Forgill in this episode, John Woodnut. 
even though you don't see him oh, tom baker's look of concern there is excellent he's you know he's 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 flippant but he's very very good at showing when this is a really weighty issue and he's genuinely you know concerned great model of the spaceship there um yeah i'm telling you even more stuff now I mean, anything you want to know. Uh, I've got a good recipe. Oh, I like the fact that it's lacti lactic fluid, though. Um, uh, puny human weapons. That's that's that's. Uh, I'm sure there was. I've got a feeling a friend of mine. I remember he was saying that his dad had shot a pilot for a thing called Puny Humans, which was a comedy uh, that never happened. Anyway, let's not get into that. I'd like the sound of Puny Humans. It's a good title. But puny puny uh, aliens don't can't really use the word puny these days um but um what was i talking about anyway we're, we're back we're back at the so there's yeah there's a few there's a few things here that aren't necessarily my ideal doctor who this this sort of tibetan you know momentarily let's you know we'll we'll get out of this by you, you know you'll never be able to suffer get again if i if i do this tibetan thing i mean i suppose it is quite you know the astral plane and all of that can be quite doctor who if you like but i don't know why i buy that less than i buy uh, you know other fantastical elements of doctor who um tom even though tom baker does it so well with those great boiled egg eyes and and you know he's he's taking this absolutely seriously and he really makes that work but as a storytelling device and as a as an element of doctor who i i have to confess i do kind of reject it um in the same way that i would reject magic you know um uh because it, it doesn't strike me as something i think that's something you know that 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 we're doing that the doctor is doing with an existing thing that we know scientifically the human body and Although there are stories, aren't there, of people that can that can go into trances. Anyway, let's talk about what I do know and do understand. This is Bernard G. High as the corporal, whose only line seems to be, what is it, sir, sir, sir. Um, this is the longest piece of continuity justification I think there's ever been. In that Bernard G. High is a private in episode one of The Web of Fear. And... Uh, Staff Sergeant Arnold says, you know, go and do this thing. He says, oh, but Sarge, I'm on this other job. And he goes, you're going to do this now. And it's it's trailing out the cable, isn't it? There's no reason for that part to have a line. It's a, it's a waste. It's more it's more expensive to have a speaking actor. And he's never seen again. In, well, he is. He's an extra in some of the, uh, uh, the, the battle sequences. But that, that character, we don't really, you know, we don't really encounter properly again. Um... And I mean, yeah, all those guys in the Covent Garden thing are shot, so let's get killed, so let's ignore that. But, oh, I love the way, by the way, uh, John Levine does that. John Levine becomes a much better actor under Canfield. I love the way when he's doing that bit with the decompression controls, he just puts his hands to his face because he's unsure. And again, it's because, I don't know how, Cam Canfield has relaxed John Levine and those little touches just make the character more believable and more real. And, and it's, you know, it's... It's a much more comfortable and actually more, much better and much more naturalistic performance. I, I mean, I love Sergeant Benton anyway, but he, he just seems sort of, he's slightly gutsier and more realistic. He's, he's always great at the sort of puppy dog loyalty and the, the, the comedy moments, John Levine. But I think with, with Canfield, he, he just gets better at the at the, at the sort of, re, the, the, the more realistic, earthy stuff. Um, I mean, yeah, my criticism of the, of the, um, of the Buddhism thing is is or the Tibetan thing is not is not leveled at any of the way that it's done by the director or, or or the actors. But I question its 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 way of getting out of danger in the sense that it 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 sort of comes out of nowhere just for the convenience of and it's like saying well any piece of jeopardy I invent I can get out of if because I'll just come up with a thing. It's 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 it feels like a bit of a cheat to me. Uh, oh, does this poor guy get trodden on? I think he does. This is great. It's spooky, misty, Camfield. Great. Well done. Beautiful. Uh, oh, that's not bad. Right. So here we have Bernard G. High, uh, who uh, I think we can we, we tried to get for the commentary for this. I'm not on the commentary for this, but I did help with with getting the personnel together. And it was really hard because there weren't many people around. But Bernard G. High has one line in the Web of Fear Part 1. And you go, why have they got a one line soldier who doesn't do anything else? And then years later, he comes back and he's been promoted to corporal in Terror of the Zygons. And I like to think that Camfield was playing the long game to go, I need to create... Uh, 
you know, continuity within this paramilitary organization that will become a very important part of Doctor Who. Whereas Terence Dix does it in the novel, he makes that Corporal Palmer. And Corporal Palmer is, of course, in The Three Doctors. And I was always a bit disappointed that, you know, because I liked it when Corporal Bell appeared a couple of times, you, you know, when it was more than just the the ones that we know, Yates, Benton and the Brigadier. And the idea that Corporal Palmer returned from The Three Doctors really appealed to me. And actually, he doesn't. And actually, he also makes the soldier in part three, Corporal Palmer as well, uh, which he isn't. He's just uh, another soldier, Peter Simmons's character, who we will see later. Um, did I say last time that t Tony Sibbald, he ended up in Thailand, but uh, he died by the time we we uh, wanted to get in touch with him. But he's he's Chuck Marshall in Quatermass, the Ealing, uh, the, the, the Houston... Uh, 1979 uh, production with John Mills and it's a really nice part he's an American veteran um, uh, astronaut who's only seen on a screen but he gets to do lots of we found we've seen these things from space and they killed everybody kind of stuff and he gets to and it's all and it's all over a sort of really bad satellite link and it's uh, it's a nice piece of work it's a good part uh, even though probably only, he was probably only <laughs> took, took up a couple of days for me he's also in the Nightmare Man as well um, but yeah this is this is all great stuff. Um, yeah, so even... But even though... Now, I've been critical, but only because part one was so perfect. But but it's both of my criticisms, the exposition dumping, which, which seems really odd. Um, uh, and the Buddhism thing. I don't mind either of them because although they might be shortcomings in the script, maybe, uh... I overlook that they haven't spoiled my enjoyment of the episode for a second. I'm only saying this because I have to comment. I have to commentate. It's the nature of the podcast. Um, is that because they're done with such utter conviction and because everything else is done so brilliantly, the production is so skilled and the acting is so good and the visuals are so wonderful, uh, I, I don't mind them. And that's interesting, isn't it, that we forgive stories we like Um their shortcomings sometimes the uh, the zygon transformation is very is excellent as well that's uh that's a beautiful you can see the cso slightly on the cable there but that's that's fine uh and uh it's interesting because sometimes aliens lose their scottish accent the chameleons do don't they <laughs> but uh, i it's quite i think it's quite nice that the uh, uh the zygons keep their scottish accent when they're uh, when they're playing us, maybe maybe that shows a little bit of advancement in sophistication. That we go well, why you know why why do suddenly aliens have to speak RP? And of course, that's a real giveaway as well. If if you know if there's suddenly the alien disguising itself as somebody went, and now I shall talk like this. We go, oh, why why have you suddenly gone to Rada? Um, that's the end of Tony Sibbald, isn't it? But uh, yeah, he had a decent career. He was the sort of he was a sort of stock. I mean, he's in a view to a kill. He's sort of stock. Uh, American working guy on British TV for quite a while, even though he was uh, he was Canadian. That's Jimmy Muir there with his face in his hands. He I think he, he pops up quite a lot in Zygons, but he pops up a lot in he's in Pirate Planet, he's in Sharder, he's a, yeah he's a, a regular regular supporting artist. Uh, um, <laughs> is this where he says a nonsense? I was on duty. Ha 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 ha. Um, I I I mean I know the Brigadier's now much a much funnier character than he was when he was thought on. But I do like that. I do like that. That's, that's pretty grim. That man's been trodden on by the Loch Ness Monster. And look, and, and Camfield always seems to dress unit better as well. You know, these look like proper, you know, capable down and dirty soldiers on, you know, you know in their fatigues on, uh, 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 r rather than the, you know, those those early unit costumes or, or, or the more sort of formal, formal ones that they have. These, the, these soldiers look like they're, you know, they're preparing to get stuff done. Um, it is excellent, uh, John Woodnut. And I believe he was... I love the way Tom Baker describes him uh, in the Tom Baker years as killingly funny. Uh, and I believe... I never had the pleasure myself, but uh, I believe he was a a wonderful, witty man. Although a friend of mine did did encounter him after a play at a theatre, and I think they got very drunk... Uh, but I'm I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not going to call out an actor for getting hammered after a performance and staggering home to his digs ten sheets to the wind because I have done that many many times. Uh, I believe Sarah as a journalist. It's nice to be reminded. I like that's what I like about this era is is reminding us of the world that they have outside. Um, 
which again is slightly hypocritical of me because I'm not I'm not wild about uh, Amy and Rory being too attached and Clara being so attached to their world that they're not traveling through space and time exclusively and yet I don't I, here I think because there's a bit less conti- I don't know because I think there's less character development in a way uh it's it's nice to see that they have real lives and I love the way um Elizabeth Sladen types with a biro in her gob because it's just uh, real yet quirky uh, and uh, you know it's 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 a little bit of business but it's not too much and too messy now Harry Main already speaks in RP so that didn't give him away so he had to come and I mean there's no point really in disguising yourself as humans if you then behave like really horrible humans <laughs> who are mean to their friends but um you know, I suppose you have to cut it some slack, but it's a, it's a, it's you know, it's a slightly less sophisticated take on you know doppelganger evil doubles. If if there's no attempt from the evil double to even vaguely sort of pass himself off as pleasant, they must have observed humans and you know gone. Now, Commander, we shall learn how to smile and say, "How are you, old thing?" You know, <laughs> but. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll cut it. So, is this is this where they split up? Split up, and three soldiers go one way, and Sarah goes the other. The way I rationalise that is that actually there's three forks, but the way that it's been shot, we didn't. But uh, yeah, if if you were to watch, I know that if I was watching with my family, my brother would go, "Oh, why is, why have three of them gone off alone and left her alone?" And I'd go, "Well, because they've all split up and gone in different directions. We just didn't see that. It was off camera." But then they'd talk all the way through this sequence and ruin it. Um, and this sequence is brilliant. Um, she's so good. I always think of Barry Letts' thing of when she auditioned, where she was, some were scared and some were brave, but she was brave and scared at the same time. Look at that shot. Absolutely brilliant film camera work. Peter Hall, I think. That's a beautiful use of shadow. But I, I mean, Peter Hall is the photographer, but, um, uh, uh, you know, Camfield is all over this. He is. He does spooky. And that, that spiky thing, is it some sort of plough thing? You can see the spikes. So she's going up, but you've seen the spikes down below. Um, I think it sort of breaks its back in this, doesn't it? And I'm sure in the book it, it lands on the pitchfork. I think there's a slight difference. God, I mean, I haven't read the book since I was in a tent when I was about, oh God, eight or nine. Yeah, I still remember bits about it, Corporal Palmer. And the, I remember this bit. And I remember one of my brother's friends reading it. And he was really old, you know, like 11. So he seemed so grown up. And I remember him being quite impressed by this bit in the book. And I remember thinking, oh, if one of the big kids likes Doctor, you know, this, this makes it feel good and proper. This is such... And a bit of this was cut when it was first released on video, wasn't it? Because it's really horrible. It's a pitchfork could have your eye out i mean literally and it's really horribly done uh and then brilliant and that 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 alien sort of caterwaul and that that rounded mouth and the, and then the dubbed sort of alien scream is absolutely brilliant just a bit of attention to detail uh, a commitment to go well let's try something that's a bit different and a bit strange you know because those, those things can often stretch credibility or look a bit silly and it doesn't at all it looks absolutely terrific um Oh, Madra, Madra, it's, it's called Madra. I also like it when the monsters get a name. Madra has, a, oh, but Britbox's subtitles call him Murdla, but I'm sure he's called Madra. Um, and yeah, good, good committed uh, 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 control manipulation there from John Woodnut. That's a great shot. The, the Zygons look absolutely amazing on film. Um, and she's sensibly gone to get the soldiers, but yeah, no, that's gone. And that's quite nice. You know, the aliens covering their tracks, keeping themselves a mystery. That's, you know, that's all good. That means that, you know, the story can still unfold, you know, in a mysterious way. She's very good. And look, she's, she's you know, she's she's got a look on her face there that, that suggests the actress has got in mind what her character's just gone through on film, you know, which she would have done a few weeks prior to that. But she's, you know, she's paying attention to her journey through the script. Um... And yeah, and this is nice that suddenly, you know, not only uh, are are our friends potentially our enemies, but uh, the Zygons are eavesdropping as well, which makes it very... Because this... I, I, I always forget actually how small this story is because it feels so much bigger. Very few guest characters. 
Um, you know, a lot of it centred around the re regulars. Tom Baker is so good, isn't he? Look at the, the intensity in his eyes. He's always interesting. He's funny when he needs to be, but he's also dangerous and otherworldly. But look at, yeah. Um, I, I love, love the embryonic design and you know it must be quite uncomfortable and you he's got he's got the microphone uh there hasn't he and uh in, in his in his upper nodule and uh, but also the decision to have them whisper you know it makes them have to sound a bit different from other monsters and and it works it works it gives them i think they're probably you know take away the the, the regular monsters you know the, the top five as it were dalek cybermen sontara and zai of the of the one-off monsters in classic who i think they're probably my favorite i think they you know and and, and 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 it makes sense that they they did eventually return uh in the in the moffat era um and in fact the zygon two-parter has been chosen for happy times and places so i wheeled that out sooner rather than later because it would be interesting to contrast because i think they they do do the double doppelganger stuff very well there and of course it has that extraordinary ending uh with that amazing speech that uh, peter capaldi does very different show uh from this but this is this is beautifully spooky and it, it just uh, you know C C camfield just makes everything seem real and there's something about the doctor charging about in a land rover that just makes him seal seem sort of capable and i don't know i don't know it just this 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 you know doesn't feel like fantasy to me it feels like sort of gritty drama with sci-fi elements albeit yes it you know it is suitable for children at tea time which is perhaps why you know the the, the, the harry acts obviously when he's a monster and all that that's brilliant cut isn't it with the doctor running towards the camera and over it and then cutting behind you know it's and all of this beautifully stuff it's not only a good picture composition but it's got an eye to how the edit's going to go uh and uh, you know that the that we're building up to the end of the episode and uh, and baker's great at that sort of stuff where he falls and gets back up again you look at that brilliant <laughs> which is funny but you never lose the sense that he's also desperately trying to evade this giant thing that's and he's so physically robust as well he's so capable you know he hurls himself into it uh big strong doctor um uh and he's, he's even good at acting with a hat uh oh and it's it, uh, yeah and he's great at all this stuff as well like, okay that thing's burning him or whatever it's it's doing and now it sticks to his hand doesn't it and he can't get it off uh which is brilliant that's a lovely little touch that you go oh oh he calls it a Oh, we call it a fiendish thing, according to the subtitles. Now, I like the design of the Scarrison. Uh, but, I mean, it's obviously a, it's only a model. <laughs> it is obviously a model. But I remember thinking this was terrible. Uh, and that's very Ray Harryhausen, isn't it? I love the way you see its little foot move. That's not as bad as I remember. I remember being... I, 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 I was slightly fearful of what the Scarrison would look like to my modern eyes now I, I'm, I suspect some of the cso is is looks better than it did on broadcast and the jury's out on how we feel about that um thanks to the remastering and all of that oh uh, and of course they're now going to do it, the loch ness i keep forgetting that this is doctor who and the loch ness monster because <laughs> i think of it much more now as a zygon story now that's quite I mean, he's quite out of focus there isn't he the doctor in order to get in order to get this the scarrison effect on there as well um do it but but i mean it's we've actually only had snatches of the thing haven't we uh and it's quite sensible to have it you know yeah have it concentrating on broton for a lot of this or or the doctor because you don't get away with many of the 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 scarrison shots although its teeth there are pretty good it is an attractive design i think it's a it's a it's a decent model but the scale uh and the scale doesn't help because you kind of need more you know, you need more ripples on 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 the facial movement for something so big. Do you know what I mean? It would it would the skin would would ripple or creak or you'd you know you'd have viscosity. Yeah, yeah. It 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 looks like a model is what I'm trying to say in a poncy way. It looks like a model. Um, but.
but not as bad as I remember. I'm maybe I'm less hung up these days. Uh, and uh, but Peter Hall, g great work on the film camera work there, Peter Hall. Um, I did not mind, well, you know, with the caveat that it's, it's it, it is probably you know production wise the weak the weakest part of the show. Uh, I think the Scarrison is actually actually fine. I do not mind the Scarrison. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Um, but there's plenty of stuff that is amazing. Uh, what's my favourite thing? Well, there's a number of things. Uh, I, I mean, I, I want to say the Zygon design because I'm I'm worried that that Daisy will beat me to it. Um, I, I'm loving what John Woodnut's doing, although I'd, I'd love him as the... Uh, as the duke as well so maybe i have to i have to reserve him really but the zygon design is the headline really of episode two because we only glimpsed them in episode one love that shot of it uh outside the decompression chamber i love those snap shots of it you know um with its hands on the wheel that uh, camfield films them beautifully and, and they look fantastic on film um but i think the best bit of episode two so I'm hoping Daisy doesn't go for the Zygons this week because I will go for the Zygons because they are, as I say, I think the finest one-off monster. I'm very fond of the Sea Devils, but I think the Zygons are are superior. I mean, I think the Zygons are A-class. Everybody really deserves a round of applause from the, from the colour to the texture to the detail to the conception uh, to the way that they're shot. The Zygons are... Um, I'm I'm in bliss thinking about the Zygons and the fact of course that their voices are the voices not and the dubbing is very good uh the uh the Keith Ashley and Ronald Goff the uh, credited actors who also return as the crinoid um Keith Ashley is in loads of Doctor Who's um uh are not doing the voices uh, they're uh, uh, Lilius Walker and R Ronald Robert Russell, the Caber and Sister Lamont Lamont are doing the voices in order that we have an echo of the people that they're disguising themselves as, which I think is a clever touch. And of course, it's a way of getting a, a, a better performance. No disrespect to Keith Ashley and Ronald Goff, but who were, you know, featured walk ons at best, whereas Lilius Walker and Robert Russell are experienced actors. So you have them doing the voices you know, you're more likely to get the performance that you want. That's a clever touch uh, on all sides. But, no, uh, my choice for episode two has got to be that barn sequence. It's horrible. Some Doctor Who is so good at taking the simplest things and making them terrify you. Because it has to, because one, it's not a hugely budgeted show. Two, it's often set on Earth. Three, uh, it, you know, it has to be something that children can watch although i would you know it's close to being unsuitable for children that that uh, that pitchfork sequence um and th and three you know it has to use ingenuity in its in its storytelling because it's a it's a television program uh and and you, you can't necessarily have big alien battles so what do you do you get a doppelganger alien disguise it as one of your regular cast members he gets to enjoy being mean for a for a, for a change and go into a barn with bales of hay you don't even have to build the set um, have him lurk in the shadows, pick up a pitchfork, tense filming, brilliant actress in Elizabeth Sladen. It's only a handful of shots. And he and he sort of pitches forward and falls off the the the, the edge, which kind of, you know, you stretches your goodwill if you want it to. If you want to not enjoy a programme, good luck to you. I think it's absolutely cracking. Uh, and, you know, things have to be depicted in a certain way as well. Uh, and off he goes and whatever happens he breaks his back or he you know in, 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 in part of my brain he lands on his pitchfork but he doesn't you can see he doesn't but again it doesn't matter and, and then that, that that unearthly cry at the end as as, as it's, it's sort of de alien death scream extraterrestrial you know uh, death rattle is glorious because and again that just ties in with how how 100% successful the Zygons are uh realized uh, so i am choosing the barn sequence which was slightly cut for the first video release of terror of the zygons 
which is also being watched by my friend Daisy. And she has chosen something which is probably going to be something else. But let's see. Let's see what she says. Now then, second thing. It's a classic, Evil Harry. Evil Harry! When he came on, I thought he was brilliant. I was like, oh man, you, when you see these characters that are usually really good and then they do that little bit of an evil thing, I'm sure the actors absolutely love it when they get something like that in a script because it really gives you something to like really bounce off. Fantastic. Evil Harry. Right, well, that was from episode two. And it's the thing I was slightly rude about and I feel bad now because Ian Marta does a very good job of it. Uh, it's just... Um, uh, and and I agree, uh, and and he's so lovely. I love Ian Martyr and I love Harry. I love this TARDIS team. Uh, and uh, I remember being a bit shocked. It was a bit of a shock when I discovered Harry was a bit oh hello old thing because Harry was quite a tough name when I was a kid. So I imagined Harry Sullivan would be a sort of chunky, you know, rough and tough, a, a bit like how I imagined Mike Yates because Mike's a pretty tough name too. And I imagined them to be very. I remember being really shocked actually by how all the sort of characters i thought would be a bit macho captain turner from the invasion you know and and they're all a bit sort of posh and they're all a bit uh they're all a bit oh, oh rather and i remember that being a bit of a shock to what i was expecting i was expecting my tough guys to be a bit less jolly hockey sticks if i'm honest but ian Marta makes it work because he's so likable and he's got such a lightness of touch and he's brilliant he is very good as scary harry uh, I don't think I get the point for that, even though Scary Harry does take part in my sequence. Uh, and Daisy has made a good case there for something that I was, I, I was, you know, slightly, slightly churlish about. Uh, and and that is good. I'm I'm all accepting of that. She's made me go. Yeah, don't get, get worried about um, whether it's you know wholly believable or not it's a it's a it's a it's a great contrast to what we usually get and it's doctor who doing what doctor who does brilliantly is showing you something familiar and turning it on its head and making it a bit scary and that's just part you know it's, that's part of that uh you know way that it uh it, it entertains and terrifies and you know keeps us on our toes uh, and yes, I'm sure it's fun if you're an actor who's playing a regular thing to get a different, you know, if he'd been in Star Trek, he'd have been a leather clad lesbian version. We know that's what happens in the parallel universes. <laughs> leather clad lesbian Harry, um, the, 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 dom the, <laughs> the searching Lieutenant dominatrix uh, of the parallel Doctor Who universe. But I'm sure somebody will write one of those for something. Um, but we just got pitchfork wielding scary, scary. Uh, the doctor told me to collect it. Uh, anyway, uh, that is the end of Terror of the Zygons 2, where Doctor Who, uh, is being threatened by the Loch Ness Monster, which again, I always, I've, uh, having, having grown up thinking of that story as the Loch Ness Monster story, and then watching it and you go, actually, it's less about the Loch Ness Monster than it is about the Zygons, hence its real title being Terror of the Zygons. Uh, and now it's really weird. I've seen this story so many times, but I'm I'm watching it unfold. I'm getting so many new and different. Well, it's not new because I'm familiar with it all. But in this context and in this way of watching it and watching it with somebody else's observations as well. But watching it in this way, I am getting more out of it, different things out of it. I'm seeing not necessarily new and different things, but I'm seeing the same things in a different way. The story is unfolding in, in a way that is, is, is opening my eyes to certain aspects of it that I always knew were there anyway. It's really, it's a really odd but hugely rewarding experience, which is, I guess, why I go back to things like Terror of the Zygons and I've just done the gunfighters and whatever story uh, I'm doing for Happy Times and Places and can watch it again and again and again. And yet yeah, I've seen Casablanca and Citizen Kane, which are two of the best films ever, as agreed by everybody. I think I've seen Casablanca once, Citizen Kane twice. Well, there we go. That said, I've seen Tremors about eight times. Uh, so perhaps I'm just thick. <laughs> perhaps I'm just an idiot. Um, but, you know, there's some there's some, you know, great moments. 2001. Oh, I mean, I've seen that, I think, grudgingly once. But I'm I'm afraid I prefer Terror of the Zygons, and if that makes me a uh, a philistine, 
then I'm very sorry about that. Uh, but it's not me. It's not actually Toby. It's it's an alien double disguised as Toby. Uh, and they're aliens who aren't uh, um, short-sightedly, you know, terse and cruel and evil. They're ones who pr prefer popular culture to high art, probably, and deeply ashamed of it. <laughs> but that's why I'm pretending it's not me, but an alien version. Whereas it's actually, it's actually just me. Oh, dear. Bye. Thanks ever so much for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydock, and my special guest, Daisy Connolly, who can be found on Twitter at Dazed, which is D-A-I-Z-E-D. -E -D. Dazed, or Die Z, depending on uh, how you interpret it. I'm grateful to Daze. And two the patrons who make these podcasts possible and they include Frank Shales, Risto Mitty Sarillo, Barry Platt, Adam Parker, Graham Knott, Kevin Murdoch, Roland Moore, Nathan Martin, Philip Marsh, Ian K. McLachlan, Joe Llewellyn, Ian Key, Chris Hyam, Siobhan Galichon, Jason Gorman, Paul Dunn, Chris Dunford Kelk, John Deere, Grant Davidson, Richard Chalk, Paul Cook, Jenny at Blue Box 99, Nigel Bromley, David, Tim Arding, Ruben Herfindahl, Stephen Moffat, Sean Reynolds, Giles Smith and Ian Smith. The music is by Dave Gates, artwork Dylan Patterson. Would you like your name to be read out in the end credits like that? Well, that is one of the many joys of being a patron. And you become a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke. And there you get advanced releases you will have listened to this six months earlier than you are now if you're not a patron where i am the sun is shining there are still prawns and the, the cities aren't aren't a fire I'm, I'm hoping they're not in six months time either um and you also get uh, bonus releases you get uh, you know stuff from my archive there's a whole podcast just for you called Far Too Much Information and the Too Much Information and Indefinable Magic podcasts. You get a month, at least a month before everybody else. Uh, and there's all sorts of other bits of bobs. Monthly AMAs, they've proved to be shockingly popular. And uh, so, yes, that's all available at patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke. Um, but if you can't or don't want to commit to the monthly thing, you can go to ko-fi.com forward slash Toby Haydock, where you can essentially stick something in my tip jar. It's just the way that uh, starving artists uh, support themselves these days for splurging out this kind of content if you enjoy it. But I know that times are tough, and uh, if this just gives you something to do while you're, while you're fighting off the apocalyptic hordes, uh, <laughs> deary, deary me, and those uh, corporations sucking you dry financially, then I'll tell you what, do something that costs nothing. Go to Spotify or iTunes or Apple or wherever you get these podcasts from and give them five stars and a couple of lines of review. It costs you nothing, but it makes me look a bit sexier in the old netherworld. And, you know, the netherworld needs me to be sexy. Yeah, that kind of ran away with me then. By netherworld, I meant internet. And by sexy, I meant visible to podcast patrons who may find this of interest. But I think you got the drift. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter at Toby Haydoke. These podcasts have their own feed at Haydoke Podcasts. I'm trying to get good at Instagram and I've been editing videos. They're called reels over there, you know, um, largely to do with my comedy club, Excess Malarkey, which is at Excess Malarkey, which is on in Manchester every Tuesday. It runs on a non-profit making basis, so it's very cheap to get in and you have excellent comics. In fact, I've recently been editing a video featuring the amazing Mark Watson. We had him not long ago. So, um, yeah, so uh, but yeah, I'm trying to get better at Instagram, but um, I, it's it's by far the the, the worst of the uh, of the social media that I currently inhabit in the sense that I'm I'm worst at it. I'm trying to get better, but I'm at Toby dot Haydoak. Um, yes, and I'm also on Twitter at Toby Haydoke, these podcasts at Haydoke Podcasts, and I have my own Facebook fan bleh, fan page. It's a page, it's a comedian page. It's Toby Haydoke Comedian, it's not me, which is would which is my personal one, but there's there's one with me. It's I mean, I think I think the pictures currently the picture's of me in black and white. I mean that's enough, isn't it? It's a professional shot rather than, you know, me lounging in my garden with my 
infants in arms because I, I I don't I don't have that. But you know what I mean. It's there's a there's a there's a there's a page for me on Facebook if you want to follow my my work stuff there as opposed to as opposed to me saying I've just had my lunch. Yum yum. Um, this is I've just had my lunch whilst touring a show, which you can see here. Anyway, you get the drift. Social media me up. Now, after that disgusting display of neediness, which is all the rage these days, I'm only doing what everybody tells me to do. It's not my natural game, but, um, you know, I w- <laughs> make a television series with me in it and I won't need to do it. Anyway, one of the beauties of the Patreon thing, uh, phenomenon, uh, is that you get feedback from lovely people who are, you know, listening to the podcasts as you release them. And... I liked this from Frank Shales, uh, who's a regular correspondent, uh, on the on the tail end of Terror of the Zygons One, which, as you'll recall, uh, um, was the uh, uh, cliffhanger was the uh, the choice of my favourite thing among, among many things in an episode. I I still think is is pretty much perfect. But um, Frank, I think, added some extra texture, so and shape. Uh, to the observations around this episode, notably an O shape. Uh, so I'm going to read out what Frank said because uh, I liked the observation. It was an observation I hadn't articulated particularly well or, or at all, and Frank has done a very good job with, and uh, it all adds to the uh, the the the, uh, the the sort of back and forth opinion about uh, about these. What's great about these episodes, and I liked this. I'd not thought of it in this way. Frank says. A lovely eulogy to and analysis of what you rightly say is a perfect episode. The pucker-mouthed Zygons with the O-mouth as it attacks Sarah in the cliffhanger are based on embryos, babies of course, even the name evokes zygotes and the fact they, they live on milk is a giveaway. There is also a hint of seahorses about them with their ribbed appearance and spined nodules which fits with their water-loving existence. It's such a shame that the new series completely missed the point and made them orange rubber suits with a mouthful of slavering spiky teeth instead. Still, that's the difference an Oscar-winning designer makes. And I think I got distracted when talking about the lactic acid, didn't I? I think I, I went off on a... I meant to comment on that because I uh, that's a lovely bit of verisimilitude where the Zygons say, yeah, we feed on the lactic acid of the Scarrison, which basically means we're, <laughs> we're breastfed by the Saracen, which Scarrison, which are the like. But it's just a way of... It's it's just a little grace. It's just a little piece of. It's a word I've I, I've overused in the past, um, but it, it really is verisimilitude. Um, and but I like that, of course, because an embryo does 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 have an O-shaped mouth. I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Or at least you know, it's it's reminiscent of thumb sucking, isn't it? That sort of O round shape. So it all sort of ties across. And of course, Madra does that scream with the O shaped mouth, as well as the the O shaped mouth of the Zygon in the cliffhanger. I love the O shape, and of course, yes, that it sort of mirrors the suckers uh, on uh, on their arms and indeed on their consoles. So I liked Frank's um, very uh, smartly put and phrased uh, observation. Uh, and it reminded me too that I think I'd g- gone off tangent when I'd meant to, uh, when I'd when I'd meant to, uh, you know, um, uh, compliment the mention of breastfeeding uh, within the context of a Doctor Who story. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, um, but yeah, because like, lactic acid does it's just a. It's just a th- it's a it's a scientific thing that t- talks of nutrients and it ju- it it just makes it a it's just a little it's just a little line that just makes the world sort of slightly more believable and understandable to us whilst also being alien and Frank's observation makes sense of the the O shape of the mouth that I love so much because it's so strange and wonderful strange and wonderful which is Doctor Who in a nutshell and indeed. Probably talk to fans as well. It's probably you too, dear listener. So thank you for being strange and wonderful.